versus wanting to get into musky fishing? Musky fishermen? Okay. I was going to do some summer casting trolling information today, which I'm still going to do. I want to cover uh, a few bases here, first of all, regarding having certain equipment. Hold on one second. I want to cover some of the equipment that's necessary to catch these fish and properly release them without harming them. Uh, a few basic items here. A big net always helps when catching fish. In a, a deeper boat, say a deep bee, a lot of guys uh, have the deep V boats, whether it be a Ranger or uh, a fiberglass or aluminum boat. These heavier, deeper nets, you can put the net on the gunnel of the boat and the fish is still in the water. You never want to bring the fish into the boat in the net. You wipe the slime off. If it's warm in the summertime, it can put a lot of stress on them and, 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 and they can they can pass away a lot faster versus keeping them in the water. They can definitely die on them. That's, that's a big thing. Always keep those fish in the net bag in the side of the boat in the water. And having, and this is a 48 inch net bag, I believe. And they make them even deeper than that. They make them, I think, 60. Uh, some of the guys that fish the Great Lakes, they've got uh, 20, 21 foot aluminum boats and they've got really deep gunnels and deep sides in the boat. Uh, the 48 may not get it there, and there's some guys that have those size boats in the inland water here too. But having a big net, this one here I just wear a base on. Some of the smaller net bags that you have, they come up to a V. The fish will lay in there curled up and they can back and stress them out as well. Having the flat square base on the bottom of the net definitely helps. The fish can lay there comfortably, they're still upright, and they can recoup themselves from the person catching them. These grippers, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of boga grips. They do rotate and it will aid if the fish wants to rotate or flop on them. I prefer the grippers, they're a little bit less stressful on the fish. And the only time I use these is when I have a fish in the net and I'm wanting to lift the fish up to use my longer pliers here to release them. That's the only time I use them and a lot of people take these grippers put it in the bottom jaw, lift them up, pop the hook out, and bring them in the boat and hold them like this. And believe it or not, that is fairly harmful to the fish. That puts a lot of stress on their jaw, and it can damage gill plates, gill rakers, stuff in their internal organs as well. Uh, and in the summer months when the water's warmer, and the weather's, water temps and weather are warmer, uh, the late mortality can set in. The fish may release well, but it may die a day or two later, and you'll find it floating. So I never hold the fish up. I just simply use these. I put it on the bottom jaw of the fish, lift it up, even holding it while against the side of the boat. And these long pliers, the longer the better. You get a pair of, even these are a little bit too short. And in a pinch, I can use them. But if you get a bait that size in a 25 pound fish's mouth, they're gonna do what they wanna do. And if they go to thrash their head back and forth, and that back hook or either front hook is in that fish's mouth. Now it's got leverage on you. And this is a 10 ounce bait. They can thrash that back and forth and you'll have a hook in your hand in very short order. And that, that's, a, that's a bad day of fishing right there. In a trip to emergency room at times. So I always use a longer set of pliers. Keep your hand back as far away as you can. And that's where these come into play also. That's why I've got some leverage. I'll lift them up and I'll put these up against the side of the boat so the fish is laying flat with its head straight up in the air for them. That way they're not going to be able to roll as much versus lifting it up and holding it to where they can still rotate back and forth or kick on it. Uh, and, you know, always, these fish in Ohio, they're all stopped. There's no natural reproduction. Uh, and, and that's the biggest part with CPR, you know, catch, photo, release. Uh, it's a stocked fish. It's not on the, the top 
of the priority list for the state of Ohio to make sure they have money and funds to stock within the hatcheries uh, to make sure we have our muskies. It's uh, the muskie fishermen say are one to three percent of the fishing population in Ohio. That's not very good odds for us that we enjoy our muskie fishing, and that's why it's very important to make sure that we do the best we can to get these fish back in the water in a timely manner, especially during June, July, and August, these warm weather months. Uh, the clubs, you know, Muskie Zinc is a big, big part of, of the muskie fishing in Ohio. There's several chapters. Uh, you know, we have fundraisers, we do raffles, and, and we donate money that is raised through those uh, proceeds to make sure that the state of Ohio has uh, minnows or any equipment that they would need within the hatcheries to raise these muskies so that we have them. Uh, eventually, it, it's going to be a dying thing. There's not going to be as much of a dire emergency we need to have musky stock in our lakes and our lakes versus say stocking walleye somewhere. So it's, it's definitely get a photo, release them as best you can, get a photo, get them back in the water, and even if you do, if it's warm in summertime and you want to uh, measure the fish, see how long it is. A lot of us use a bump board and it's usually a piece of metal or a wood, uh, the PVC board, and they make them. The best thing to do, the floor of your boat's going to be the hottest part of the boat in the summertime. And that's where you typically lay them to get an accurate measurement. If you can, at least dip it in the water or splash some water in there to get it wet so it's not as hot and it's not going to rub as much slime off the fish uh, as it would putting it on dry and super warm. And get them back in the water, hold them upright for a few minutes, and just hold them by the tail. Don't grip and don't rub the slime off. Just hold them upright, swishing them back and forth sometimes will help. Just hold them upright and they're just going to eventually get their bearings and swim back off. 90% of the time, very well, and you don't have a problem. If they do float back up on you, which they do once in a while, as long as the fish is floating upright and they're not going belly up, that fish is still in good shape. Leave it go for a while, maybe go fish somewhere for 10, 15 minutes, come back and just check on. And if it's still floating, maybe give it some further assistance from there. And I've even went as far as a handful of times in the last 15 years, I've had to put them in the live well with fresh oxygenated water coming in uh, from the aerator and give them 15 minutes to a half hour and that can help them as well and put them back in uh, and they usually go right back down. On to the next thing here regarding baits. I manufacture bucktails myself and brand new hooks out of the box are never that sharp. A hook file, and this isn't even a hook file, this is made by Warp Sharp. It's got a flat diamond sharpener on this side. And it works very, very well for large diameter hooks. You have to be very picky. I usually use a diamond file. I'm talking five out, six out, seven out hooks. They're very thick and they're hard to sharpen. Not like with a bass bait or even a smaller. This is like a two lot one x You can sharpen that with anything and it'll sharpen well. The diamond hones will take a lot more material off and get the hook sharper for you where it will last longer. Casting or trolling, musky baits, on average 20 bucks a piece. And there's some baits that run up to a couple hundred dollars a piece as well. So you lose two or three baits over the course of a weekend or a day, and plus all your gas money and time, you've lost a fair amount of money, probably not counting any fish. So insult to injury, losing a handful of baits. A plug knocker, great investment. There's a lot of guys, uh, Facebook selling, 20, 30 bucks. This is a smaller one that uh, actually my father made for me years ago. This is probably only a pound or two. It's actually a little light. Guys make them, they vary anywhere from uh, three to five pounds. I've seen guys make them eight pounds. And they're all the same. They have a weight attached to the line up top right here. You've got chains on the bottom. So if I'm trolling around with my $35 crankbait right here, I snag a stump. I actually, I want that thing back. All I have to do, reel back up the excess to the point of where I'm snagged with below me. I try to attempt to get on the back side with the boat as best I can. If the bait was going this way, I obviously I want to be on the back side and get over here. If I can't unlodge it by shaking the rod tip or pulling some, with this right here, I will take the line and I wrap it all the way down through there. Send this thing down and the chains will grab these hooks right here 
just like that, and they'll pull that bait right off that snag, nine times out of ten. And uh, this is a, a great, great investment to have. And you have to excuse me, one more item I forgot today, another great tool to have on the boat uh, when releasing muskies, long through pliers, and some rippers, boat cutters, boat cutters. Once in a while, you'll get them, they'll suck a bait all the way down their throat. And if it's stuck within the gill plate, rather than taking the long pliers and sticking them down there and pulling and frying, you're going to pop a gill plate loose from their body somewhere. Uh, and, and that will most definitely uh, kill them you know, within a short time, especially in warm weather months with warm water. So bolt cutters, it's, it's sometimes better to take the bolt cutters or hook cutters, cut it, whether it's, in, it's underneath the gills or into the mouth, cut the hook out, let them get back in the net, rejuvenate themselves, revive a little bit and get their bearings, then come back in a few minutes later, lift them back up, and go ahead and pop that hook up in the bottom of the pliers. Uh, and you're going to have a lot less fish dying on you that way. And it's par for the course. Uh, if you musky fish long enough, you're going to have muskies die. It's just the way it is. Uh, and we do all we can with these proper tools to get them back in the water, get them safely. And even with taking photos, get that fish up, hold them horizontal like this, and I carry a set of just cheap uh, uh, work gloves with me that have some latex liner on them or a rubberized vinyl liner on them. Get your hands in the gill plate, you can tear your hands up in here very easily. If they start squirming on you, there's gill rakers up in there and they will, they'll cut you open pretty fast and give you, give you a sore hand for a few days. So I take, I always have my gloves on and um, I, have, I have a guide service as well I take customers and that is a big thing for me. Make sure you get these gloves on for me, I don't want nobody to get cut. And get those fish back in the water, I said, Hold them upright and let them just fix themselves, rejuvenate themselves a little bit. Um, now I want to get into a little bit of summer trolling. I will start trolling uh, some of the deeper water, 10, 15 foot of water, uh, around the last few weeks in May to the 1st of June. There's never really a set time, it's just what the water depicts, what the water temps are, and what, what time of the month the fish have spawned and when they're recouping. A good starting point for myself, I'm going to uh, find an area that I think that the muskie may be spawning close to. And the areas, some of your deeper water and ledges, points, offshore structures adjacent to that are going to be the first places that I look at. And it doesn't have to be deep water. Uh, it could be six, eight, ten foot of water. And you're going to have certain days, you have high pressure building, the barometers through the roof. Those fish would generally tick out off that a little bit, say 12 to 15 foot of water. Uh, early in the morning, late in the evening, or a day with partial cloud cover, I'm going to look at that still, that maybe 8 to 12 foot range. And here are a handful of baits that I'm going to start with. And a lot of people think you have to have big baits for big fish. Uh, absolutely we do, but not all the time. In the spring, after they come off the spawn, this time frame when I'm going to start trolling in June, and as you lunge and lurch 22 short, that is a fantastic bait for spring. You can run this bait all year round, warm weather or, or warm water or cold water periods. It will work very well. And this bait, you know, on 40, 50 pound braids, you're going to get down an average of uh, eight to 10 foot, depending on how much line you have out. And that's a good depth and a good starting point uh, to go with when targeting these fish in the first couple weeks in June, as they, as they start to move out off the structure, shoreline structure. Uh, this is another shad style bait. This is a boss shad. Now this is a little bit larger profile, a little bit bigger, steeper lip. 10 to 12 foot once again is gonna be a good starting point for this bait. Uh, and you may find some bigger fish out maybe 12 to 14 foot of water. It's still a good starting point. And like I said, you have to look at, look at the day, the conditions. Have you had a cold front pass through recently? Uh, the cold front, say the fish were in eight foot of water one day, the next day those fish may be in 14 foot of water laying on the bottom versus in a little bit shallow water, suspended. So if you go to a new spot one day and you're catching them shallow like that and you get a cold front pass through, next day go out deeper and don't be afraid to take some baits and get aggressive and tick bottom in 12 or 14 foot of water. 
And with that line, you're gonna have to let a little bit more line out. And with this, you're just looking for a reaction strength. Uh, if they're very neutral after a cold front, going through and digging bottom, bouncing off rocks, and those lips will dig in and bounce off structure. And that bait will flare up and kick out and do all kinds of different things. That can cause a good reaction strength. And uh, you can pick up quite a few fish doing that at certain times of the year. Uh, I have another bait here. This is by a gentleman in Columbus. His name is Greg Kemp. Uh, these are extreme musky baits. This is uh, a fantastic bait. I will troll these in the spring as well. If I can't get my, my, my trolling bite going, you can take these same baits and cast them up in the same type of water. And they may, they may not want to hear the noise of a boat or, or deal with the speed of, of the bait going by a little faster versus you cast them. So uh, these are always a very great versatile bait to throw also. Um, and color-wise, I have a lot of people ask me, what's, what's the best color? What's your favorite color? Well, I like the shad colors, uh, grays, silvers. Uh, I do like some, search, some chartreuse. This is, in the Lunge and Lure, this is one of my favorite colors right here. And they've got some Tennessee shad, shad colors of all that work really, really good too. And sometimes there's, sometimes, some days it doesn't matter. Uh, this thing could be purple with pink and green polka dots in it. If it's at the right depth, they're going to eat it. Um, sometimes color, color doesn't matter. You can just find those days. Um, I've had a, uh, a few days, for example, we were up one day using the 22 shorts. I would run a trolling pattern in the spring. And we caught five or six fish that day. It didn't matter what color we put on, they wanted the 22 shorts. If I went to the extreme bait, they just, there was a frequency change that they just did not care for. Um, and then I have a lot of people ask me, well, how do you know this? You have to, I don't, I don't know when I show up on the lake that day. You have to go to, and I explained to people yesterday in my uh, seminar from yesterday. When, when I go to a lake, say I haven't been there for a few days, I've been running my normal pattern, I'm going to always first start with the pattern that put the last fish in the boat for me. I'll run that a couple hours, run the same baits, run the same water, the same depth, same speed. If that does not work for me, I'm going to start switching baits up. I'll run, if I have four poles out, I'll swap those baits out every 10, 15 minutes. Size, shape, color, depth, all that. I'll vary all that until a rod goes off and, I, and I'm able to put a fish in the boat. So then they ask me, well, what if you don't catch a fish doing that? Now I'm going to go hit some shallow water with some weeds, uh, shorelines, or some flats that are some offshore structure maybe. And I'm still going to go back and start with what I caught the fish with flats. That's going to be these same crankbaits right here. Uh, you can cast. This is I, I, I fear this more of a trolling bait. You can cast it. Uh, I would rather throw something that's a little bit lower impact, and I can retrieve it faster uh, and cover more water with it. Uh, musky fishing is all about covering more water, and trolling you can't cover any more water than you can trolling. You've got four four poles. Two people in the boat, you're running four poles for the course of the day, and you covered 10 miles. You've now covered 40 miles of water in one day. Two guys casting, you're not going to cover a quarter of that. And there are applications where they don't want, they're not going to eat baby control. And you have to get more precise uh, with the casting. They might want to be in four foot of water, and I typically don't troll that a whole lot. But I said, fact that you have to let the fish to pick and tell you what what you have to do for the day. Uh, on cold front days in this time of the year, you can catch a muskie on a glide bait this big. That's a big bait. And they get very aggressive and, and the weather's been stable for a few days. They will eat this stuff all the time. And like I mentioned earlier, the, the, let the weather depict a lot of what you do and how you do it. If I had a pattern rolling with that glide bait right there, I go up there, a cold front blows through. 15 degree temperature difference from day to day. Uh, stiff northwest wind and the barometers went down a little bit. I'm going to start with that once again. Knowing it's probably not going to work very well. You know, I may raise a few fish and they're going to be lazy falls. I'm going to go back to my crankbait. I'm going to cover the same water. And this is made by 
the same gentleman that makes this bait right here. Uh, this is an extreme. It's called uh, an extreme mini. It's a glorified bass bait. Cold fronts typically push the fish out and push them on the bottom at times. Or they'll bury back in the cover. Wheat bed. They'll jam themselves back in the middle. The fish that are laying out on the edges on the bottom, if you can get this thing down with a light enough line and get it to take the bottom in front of their face, downsizing is the key. And you can catch the same fish you would catch on this 10 inch jerk bait right here on this bait the next day after a cold front. So with cold fronts, sometimes downsizing may be the key to it. Uh, if you're, and this is for casting, if you're trolling, you may want to downsize trolling baits as well. So once again, if I'm trolling this, that cold front blows through, I'm still gonna cast or troll this, either one. And then I said, let the fish tell me what they, what they want for the day. Mid, Mid-June, we start looking uh, offshore structure, basically. Stuff in the middle of the lake. Uh, uh, several of the lakes that I fish, they have mid-lake structure where there's 25 foot of water all the way around, and you've got a hump. You may have some saddles, some bridges to it, uh, or even the very end of a point. If I was targeting 10, 12 foot of water, now I'm getting to the point where the water temps are approaching 80 degrees uh, surface, and these fish are starting to kick off. Now I'm, I'm targeting my, when I was in the weeds, these fish were there at 8 to 12 foot of water. Now they're going to go out, they're going to move out, and they're going to start going to the deeper ends of the lake. Now they're not going to be so much, uh, they're not going to be uh, associated with structure so much versus suspended. Okay? Now people ask me, well, what, what do you mean suspended? The fish is just going to hang out. It, it could be over 25 foot of water. It's going to pick a depth. So once again, when I'm in that shallow water trolling, I'm targeting 8 to 12 foot of water. I'm still going to target 8 to 12 foot of water just over, say, 20 to 25 feet of water now. Those fish won't change the depth that they're at. They'll just move out over the deeper water. The crankbaits still work very, very well. Now I'm getting to the point where they're, gonna, they're getting more aggressive because the water's warmer and their metabolism is much, much higher now. Now I can start switching to the big stuff. That's a huge, huge red October tube. Uh, this is usually midsummer, August. I go really big come August, but June, July, this is my favorite size right here. Okay? Uh, and you can see I have a black one that's ripped in half. This is still good color here too. Though. There's not a whole lot left here. Um, I have a rig that made these. There's a, there's a large, almost a saltwater jig that goes in here. Uh, ounce and a half, two ounces, three ounces. You can vary it. Then I have another hook coming out at the bottom. On the jig head, I have my line tie here. I have another single hook here and another treble hook coming off here. So there's there's hooks on all ends of this. When you get into the big bait such as this or the bigger tube here, uh, bulldogs, bag bulldogs I like this time of the year too. This is these baits, and, and the reason I, I prefer these baits, these baits are going to reach the, the, the depth that these fish are sitting in the fastest. Now I can do a, a start, stop, pause, and pull retrieve, and it's going to fluctuate from maybe above it to in that zone to back below it. Now I just imagine hey, you want this bait arcing up, hanging, pausing for a moment, and dropping back down. Now I'm going to, now I'm covering, if, if I'm looking for a fish in full foot of water, now I'm essentially, I may cover 8 to 14 foot deep over that deeper water where those fish are suspended. And each bait has a different purpose. When you get into tinkering around with the different size jig heads, on this tube here with, a one, with an ounce and a half jig head, you're going to get some hang time on that bait. You have to slow your retrieve down a little bit. And it's not so much of a jerk with the rod. Now I'm doing a sweep with it. I hang tight for a second, I pick up my slack line, and I sweep again. The bigger baits, you're a more drawn out jerk slash pull. You're, and I, I whip it kind of at the end, and you want to make that bait go up, then back down. At the very end, jerk back up, then come back down. When you sweep, I'm just, I want that bait doing this. Just one fluid movement through the water column. 
the tubes from ounce and a half to three ounce, obviously three ounce, it's going to fall head first. The bulldogs, on this internal harness, there's a lot of weight in the head. The bait falls head first. Uh, and there's an application in certain lakes. The muskies within Leesville really like the magnet bulldogs. Uh, I fish West Branch a lot, uh, myself and guide trips. I prefer the medusas. In the summertime, the regular size, this is a husky, this is the next size up. The regular size in this is, is my go-to uh, June, July, August. The internal harness in this, the weight is distributed back from the head all the way through the center, back in the back floor of the bait. So once again, it's still got the weight, but there's a lot of hang time for this bait. And they may follow them as soon as you change direction, and that bait stops and hangs there, now it gives them time to react and respond and come up and hit the bait. Something else I want to cover, um, equipment can be very, very important with throwing baits this big, whether it's the bulldogs, the tubes, the medusas, um, and I've even got a swim bait here that I started messing with and trying last year. That's a really cool bait. Um, I've had some action on it, but I, I got it late, so I'm gonna run for, for next summer. This, this bait weighs five, six ounces. There's not a whole lot to it. These baits here, you're varying anywhere from eight to uh, 12, 13 ounces. My rod and reel of choice, I have, uh, it's an eight and a half foot extra, extra heavy rod. And it's, they're only meant for this, this, this kind of equipment. And I've got certain gear ratios that I keep them for certain baits as well. You can get away with an eight foot, seven and a half, extra, extra heavy, or an extra heavy, as long as you have a low rate anywhere from say, uh, two to 10 ounces in that range, you can easily throw these baits. If you go less, uh, say you take a, a seven and a half or eight foot, medium heavy to heavy, of course you can still use it, it'll still work for you. But the amount of energy you're going to expel when you cast that thing over your head, because you're not going like this, versus Luger bass fish, and bass fish, you're flipping here. Now I'm taking a six to 10 ounce bait and even heavier, and I, it's best to go over my head, use the equipment I have, and the longer rods usually have a round grip down here at the end for you to put your hand on. Now I'm just rotating forward and let that bait go. These things, they do the work for you, but that motion of getting that rod back here and pushing yourself forward to get that bait out, that'll wear you out really, really fast. So it'd be about like casting this on a snoopy pole. You're gonna be doing a lot of work so you're not breaking stuff or putting any extra wear and tear on your equipment. And that's why rod and reel specific combos work very well. And I've catered a lot of, of rod and reel combos to specific baits. Yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of equipment to have in the boat and, and it takes some time and, and money and stuff to get involved with this. Uh, whereas a guy can go and fish for six hours a night and fish for 10 or 12 hours if you need to. Because you're not as worn out using uh, subpar or equipment that's not geared towards the base.